Good afternoon. I'm Ken Hirsch, Director of Computing at the School of Law, and I am pleased to welcome you to the inaugural lecture in the Technology in the Practice and the Practice of Law series. We believe this is a one-of-a-kind series in the country, and it's our intention to provide you and your fellow students an opportunity to learn how you will encounter technology when you leave the law school and move into practice, wherever that may be. And our inaugural speaker is David Whelan, who is director of the American Bar Association's Legal Technology Resource Center and has been there since 1999. I've known David for about eight years, and previous to the ABA, when I met him, he was in charge of computing at the SMU Law School in Dallas, Texas. And uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to David Whelan. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. You can tell we've got all the smart people in the room today. Um, my job is uh, to help lawyers with technology. The ABA's Legal Technology Resource Center is a free place that you can send email or, or phone call or visit us on the web and get advice about how to use technology. Uh, when I looked at uh, Duke's uh, graduates, uh, most, of you, uh, most of you will be going to uh, big firms uh, in private practice, and so the orientation for this discussion today is uh, technology uh, in large law firms, what you might expect, what a large law firm is, uh, the types of technology you'll see in courtrooms, and then also uh, to those people who will not end up in the largest law firms or even a, a large law firm, you may be going solo, you might be going small firm, uh, to keep in mind that some of this technology will actually work at any firm size. So uh, without further ado, we'll uh, move forward. Uh, typical disclaimer, we are lawyers. Uh, and everything I say today is my own opinion. The ABA uh, official spokesperson is over in Raleigh. That's President A.P. Carlton. Um, so everything I say is based on uh, statistics and research that we've done in our department but it's my opinion. So let's talk a little bit about what a large law firm is. People like to say, you know, Baker and McKenzie, clearly they're the biggest uh, U.S. law firm in, in the world. Um, what is a large law firm other than a law, a law firm that has 3,500 lawyers? Uh, many of you will go to a large law firm, uh, but it will depend. So let's talk a little bit about what that is. So that gives you a perspective of, of where exactly you'll be expecting to see technology and perhaps why the technology that you'll see in those large organizations will be set up the way it is. A large law firm is typically not as big as you think. When you think of a large law firm, you may think of thousands of lawyers. Uh, there are only about 12 uh, law firms based in the US that have over 1,000 lawyers. So we're really talking about much smaller firms than you might think. And those big firms are spread out in multiple offices. So you have 50 or 100 lawyers in one place, 50 or 100 lawyers in another, and they're spread out geographically either around the country or around the world. Medium-sized firms, what I'll sort of describe in a second as firms with 40 lawyers up to about 100, will have a lot of the same characteristics as a large law firm. So if you end up going into a firm that doesn't have more than 100 lawyers, you will still likely see a lot of this technology. Uh, if you don't see it, then I would definitely uh, encourage your law firm to look at it, because these types of technology are making the large law firms work faster and better, and they will allow mid-sized firms to do it as well. Mid-sized firms probably start with about 40 lawyers. Add to that then 40 support staff. We're seeing about a one-to-one -one ratio of lawyer to non-technical support staff then throw in about five technology staff, and you're looking at a pretty basic mid-sized firm. When you start to go up to 100 lawyers, you're then talking about uh, approximately 100 staff, but the, the count goes down. Attorneys are sharing secretaries, or they're sharing uh, staff much more. The technology staff ratio goes to about 1 to 10 for lawyers. So when you start to get into the larger law firms, you're seeing about the same proportion as you're seeing in the mid-sized. So again, when we talk about technology in the large law firm, it is actually scaling down to the mid-sized firms as well. The rest of the discussion today is really going to be about firms that are 100 lawyers or more. To put that in perspective, in 1995, the ABA did some research. 75% of lawyers go into private practice. The other 25% bail like I did, or uh, they go and work as judges, or they do something else with their degree, but they're not in private practice. Out of the, that, about half are in private practice uh, as solo practitioners. <clears throat> so when we talk about the number of lawyers that we're talking about and where uh, the large law firms are. We're really talking about a very, very small amount of the legal profession. 17% will be in law firms of 50 or more. And if you look at the last uh, survey of the top 250 firms from the National Law Journal, we're talking about 110,000 lawyers are in 250 firms. And that's about 10% of all the lawyers in the country. So you get a sense of there are these massive large law firms at the top, and then it quickly scales down to the midsize, and then the small and the solo are the big base of lawyers at the bottom. So you may go to a large law firm to start off with, and you may end up transferring down to a smaller firm or a mid-sized firm, 
uh, you'll want to make sure that the technology that you have at your, at your fingertips in the large law firm comes with you. You take advantage of all the skills and, and all the things you can do with it while you're at the large law firm so you can take it with you, with you when you leave. There are three large law firms in the top 250 that are based in North Carolina. These names are probably familiar to you. I was interested to see that there are 67 more firms, national firms, that are not based in North Carolina, but that have offices of 50 lawyers or more in North Carolina. So we're really talking about an awful lot of firms with lawyers of 50 or more, but we're probably talking about firms with 100 lawyers or less in each office. Again, Martindale Hubble says that there are 3,500 of those law offices. So when we talk about a large law firm, don't think of a large corporation where all the staff and all the lawyers are in a single place. We're typ typically talking about a very distributed environment where there will be offices in many places, there will be staff in many places, and the technology will have to connect up all of those different offices so that the information can be shared by all the attorneys. Technology staff. You will never see more dedicated technology staff than you do here at Duke, but every law firm has uh, technology staff that that's all they do. They will be supporting the servers, they will be supporting the email, they will be helping you with your desktop, they will be making sure that your applications run, they may be doing training, uh, they will be doing all of the things that you would expect uh, this technology staff here at the, uh, at the school to do, um, but they will be doing it mostly behind the scenes. Again, you'll see about a one uh, tech person to ten lawyer ratio, where here it's probably what, one to fifty, maybe more. So the, the ratio of staff to lawyers is, is much closer, um, but that doesn't mean that that person is necessarily hanging around next to your desk. There will be a lot of people who are just supporting the administrative functions of the law firm. Again, a difference from law school. It's not going to be just the technology you use in the office. Many law firms are providing technology like Palm Pilots, uh, Bla RIM Blackberries for wireless email. They're providing laptops. Those things go on the road. They go home. Your tech support will come with you. So those tech support folks will be expecting that you will have problems when you're at home, when you're on the road, and you'll need to be working with them in order to get those problems resolved. You may already be a tech guru uh, in your own mind or in reality. Um, you'll still want to work with those IT staff in order to make sure that the systems that they've set up on your particular device will still work uh, after you've tinkered with them with the systems back in the main office. <clears throat> it's not surprising that the largest law firms are spending millions and millions of dollars. When you think about a large law firm, you have to lose the concept of a, a professional collegial environment. We're talking about big corporations. We're talking about thousands of people with thousands of dollars uh, spent on every single desktop in front of them, uh, millions of dollars on the systems that support them, the wiring and everything else. So we're really talking about corporate type technology budgets. At the largest law firms, we're talking about strategically planned technology too. So uh, where you might go out and buy your own laptop or, or, or you might be able to wangle a particular software product to be installed on a uh, computer here, uh, for a personal use, that doesn't happen at the largest law firms. They are planning to buy a single product for every computer, a single uh, type of computer for every person. If they buy RIM Blackberries, they buy them for all of the attorneys. It's done in a strategic way so that they know exactly how much they're spending and exactly where that money is going to. There's a focus on what's called enterprise uh, computing where uh, there's an email server and everybody uses Outlook and you use Exchange. You don't get to choose to use Eudora. You don't get to choose to use something else. It's a very focused uh, um, uh, lockstep type of approach to technology. Now, I'll completely contradict everything I just said <clears throat> because lawyers are in some ways like tenured faculty. A tech person at a law firm is typically not going to be able to say, no, you absolutely can't do that unless there's a policy that has come down from a management committee or a technology committee. So you still may want to buy a laptop if they don't provide it to you. You still may want to buy a Palm device uh, if they don't provide it to you. But make sure that they will work uh, with the systems that are in that law firm or that you might be able to wangle tech support out of the IT staff in order to do that. Uh, just because it's a large law firm doesn't mean that they're going to buy all the gadgets that you might see uh, another law firm buying. Uh, when we see law firms buying uh, PDAs and devices like that, it's not across the board. Only about 50% of the largest law firms are buying PDAs or, or Blackberries for their lawyers. Uh, so there is a big gap for all those other large firm lawyers about if they want to use a PDA, who's going to pay for it and how are they going to get it. So management decisions. Again, this is something that most of you will not be involved in when you get to a large law firm or even a mid-sized firm. There's going to be a technology committee that will have associates and partners on it. It will have IT staff. Most of the time, there will be a technology committee that's making all the decisions about technology in your firm. There may be a firm management committee that is not technology oriented. They will be making the decisions, or some of those decisions may be delegated down to the information system staff so that the people who are actually implementing a system will make the decision. Uh, and you will just notice changes or new tools you won't necessarily have any input into, whether it's Microsoft or whether it's Corel or whether it's a particular product. 
and most individuals will, will not be, uh, most individuals not will not, not have input into the particular decision. So they're not going to necessarily come around and canvas you and say, how do you feel about this or how do you feel about that? They may ask for input into an interface once they've developed a website or an internet site for you to use. But most of the decisions that are being made about technology in the large law firms are done without a whole lot of uh, input out to the, uh, the lawyers. So let's talk a little bit about what your law firm technology will look like. It's not going to look a whole lot different from what you have now. One of the big differences is that there will be a lot more policies that you'll be subject to. And these are not meant to s prescribe you from doing things so much as to remind you that there are limits as to what you can do with the internet or with email uh, or with uh, research or with the computer that you have. You won't necessarily be able to download and install any application that you'd like to onto your desktop. There are issues about whether you, can op whether you download something and open a, a hole in your firewall and so you, the client confidential data that is on your systems is now available to people over the internet. Uh, it's whether you're sending confidential email uh, confidential information through email to, your, to or from your clients or whether the d data that you're sharing over your computer is somehow accessible uh, in ways that you hadn't intended. So these policies will have been thought out by management committees and will limit you as to what you can send and what you can't send uh, and how you can use it. So when you get to the law firms, make sure you understand exactly what those policies are so that you can make sure that you're abiding by them when you send or use email. Uh, at law school, it's pretty much a free world. You can send whatever you want to. You can, you can use almost whatever language you want to. Um, there are very few rules you'll find in law firms that it's much more prescribed. We're also seeing that although there are a few large law firms that have these right now, we're seeing email retention uh, plans and document uh, retention plans coming along. Enron and Anderson don't have to say a whole lot more about that kind of topic. Um, but lawyers are very concerned about how much data they have stored because they're saving all of their emails and all of their files. And where they might have had a paper document retention plan, they haven't translated that paper document uh, retention plan over to the electronic world. And so they've got stacks of email, years and years of email, and years and years of documents that may not be useful to the firm as far as a, a model uh, document or a, a good email, um, things that should be gotten rid of but, but uh, haven't been. And so they're starting to look now at how long do they have to keep these electronic files as an analog to their paper files, and then how, how much they have to get rid of. So if you're saving documents onto your hard drive rather than onto the network's document management system, you may be inadvertently saving files that should be gotten rid of through a document management process um, and, and causing yourself problems down the line. So when you get an opportunity to, to use the, the firm document management, knowledge management, case management systems, make sure you do so, so that your local hard drive doesn't become a, I won't say cesspool, but essentially a, a pit of uh, documents that you don't really know what's out there and then can be discoverable or, uh, or, or found through other mechanisms later. Networking will come as no surprise. All the large law firms are using T1s or T3s and, and often multiple ones. Uh, when you talk about a large law firm, you're talking about multiple offices in almost every single case. So you have fast internet between the two offices or three offices, and then you have uh, fast internet out to the, uh, to the research tools. You'll be using Westlaw and Lexis. Proprietary software is going away for that sort of thing. Almost everything you do with the internet will be through a browser. Virtual private networking. If you haven't used it before, it's going to be a common thing for you to use when you get out into practice. It allows you to use any internet connection if you're at a hotel, if you're at home, uh, if you're at the law school, uh, you'll be able to turn on your uh, internet connection and then you start a little program called virtual private networking and it creates an encrypted path over the internet to your law firm. And so it means that you can share data with your law firm without worrying about it being uh, caught by others as it tra is transmitted over the open internet. It also means that you don't have to dial in directly to your law firm uh, into a server that they have available and deal with those slow connections. So it means that wherever you are, as long as you've got an internet connection, you'll be able to also get access to your law firm's data. Wireless LANs like you have here in the law school are, are not common. Uh, they probably won't be common for a little while. Um, one of the things about large law firms, again, if you think about them as corporations, they've got lots of wire and they've got lots of space and they've invested an awful lot in their wiring uh, infrastructure. What we're seeing as far as wireless networks is that they're coming up in conference rooms, they're coming up in very uh, uh, focused areas, but for the most part, law firms are uh, using lots and lots of wire uh, and they find that to be the, the uh, most effective solution primarily because they're not doing a whole lot of renovation. If they need to, to uh, pull a, a piece of wire, typically they've already got it lying in the floor, and they just pull it up through the, uh, the floor, and they've got their new staff person um, added to the, to the network. Computers, desktop PCs, if you're a Mac user, I'm really sorry. Um, enjoy it while you can. Uh, computers are primarily desktops, although we're seeing an awful lot of laptop users now, uh, primarily in the large law firms. If you don't have a laptop on your desk, you may want to ask for one as, as part of your uh, your signing bonus. Um, it, it definitely is something that large law firms are looking at, and they are not doing that globally. So they may have laptops on some desks and desktops on others, uh, but you definitely want to look at that as something for you, because I think laptops are definitely the future 
uh, for, for desktop computing. Um, what we're seeing, though, is even if you don't have a laptop on your desk, most law firms will have a laptop lending pool. And so you'll at least have access to one if you go on the road. Clearly, it's not as convenient as having your own uh, machine that you can take with you anywhere, uh, but those things are out there. And then wireless communication. Forget wireless ne networking for a while. We're just talking about wireless email. Um, we're not seeing a whole lot of it. And it's only happening at the large law firms. So if you go to a medium-sized firm or smaller, typically you're not going to see uh, rim blackberries and those kinds of devices. They're happening at the biggest firms. Sir? A rim blackberry looks a little bit like this. Turn, th turn this sideways, paint it black, and give it a, a, a very small uh, thumb keyboard at the bottom. And I can receive and send wireless email over this device. Anywhere I am, it will automatically send and receive. So I can send email to my network uh, at the office. I can receive it anywhere in the world. Even in airplanes, you'll hear them sometimes beeping when they shouldn't be. Um, but uh, Blackberries are, are, have become the almost ubiquitous wireless email device. This little deal will also pick up wireless email, but it's not as convenient as, as the Blackberry. Uh, but you'll see, as the numbers show, large law firms are, are buying PDAs at a certain level. And when they're buying them, it's almost always the rim Blackberry. doesn't come as a surprise. How many cell phones in this room? Yeah, lots. <laughs> Most lawyers also have cell phones. It's a good communications device. They found that it's getting out of control, and I'll talk a little about, a, a bit about that in a moment. When do you turn it off? When can your clients not call you? That'll be something you'll have to think about when you get there. But almost uh, just over 70% of lawyers have these cell phones. Uh, and wireless email is popular, like the Rim Blackberry, but it's very localized. It's only happening at those large law firms, uh, mostly because you can't get the power of the RIM BlackBerry software unless you have a pretty substantial installation and you're willing to pay 40 bucks a month for every single person who's got a RIM BlackBerry. When you're talking about those kinds of dollars, you need to have a large law firm who can support that kind of bulk. So again, large law firm lawyers, if you're going and you're, uh, you've got a lot of uh, leverage to sign up, get a laptop and get your BlackBerry right as you come in the door and you'll be set up for the rest of your career. Uh, what we're seeing for everybody else and also for a lot of the law firms who haven't gone to BlackBerry are convergence devices where they may have bought a Palm Pilot. How many Palm Pilots in the audience? Or equivalent. This is a handspring visor, so that's where my uh, loyalty lies. You may have bought a PDA, and you may carry a cell phone. So who wants to, to carry two devices? Well, in the past, if you had a handspring, you could get the little phone and hook it in here. And now I've got a cell phone and a PDA in one. That was a little bit clunky, because you've got to carry two pieces still. The future will be this device. Ta-da. The uh, Kyocera hand, uh, smartphone or the Handspring Trio, this kind of device is, is what's coming along. And if you look, let's see if I can get my mouse pointer here. If you look down here, you'll see a typical cell phone keypad. But right above it, you'll start to see uh, typical components of a PDA, uh, the place where you would use your graffiti um, with your stylus, the buttons that allow you to, to move to your calendar and to your contacts, and a color screen that shows you all of the icons you would ha have on a Palm Pilot. So this is the future, and the future is now to the extent that the devices are available, they're just not being bought broadly. But I think that they will be in the next year or so. Because this really provides a lot more functionality than a RIM BlackBerry. If you're going with something uh, where you want to do more than e email, more than wireless email, then something like this will connect up to a, 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 a keyboard or, or other devices. You can actually do uh, PowerPoint presentations off these things. You can do uh, documents that can then be dumped into Microsoft Word and so on. So these are uh, becoming more powerful every day. How many Corel Word Perfect users? Stay in law school. Uh, Corel is really disappearing. Uh, it's still out there. It's mostly not in the large law firms. It's, it's, if it's out there at all, it's going to be in s uh, small firms. Uh, one of the things, again, about lockstep technology is that when you get into a large law firm, you're going to be using what everybody else uses, because you need to worry about compatibility issues both with your uh, peers inside the law firm and with your clients. Your clients are going to be using Microsoft uh, Office products. Even when we see Corel Word Perfect still lingering in the large law firms, they're using Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, they're using Microsoft Access and Microsoft Excel. So it's only the word processor that is still holding on uh, in the largest law firms. Um, they're using Microsoft Outlook for email, they're using Microsoft Internet Explorer for internet, and they're using Microsoft Windows operating systems, either 2000 or XP on, on all, the, all the desktops. So even when they're using something else, like Novell Groupwise for groupware or email, Microsoft has really got a lock on just about every other system in the large law firms. And Linux, surprisingly, hasn't come in yet. 
Um, Lawnet Law Firms. Uh, a word about Lawnet. Uh, all the large law firms have a support group called Lawnet. It's a uh, membership organization where all the CIOs and all the tech staff get together and they discuss who's doing what and how to do what they can with the technology dollars and, and the techn technology resources that they have. The Lawnet Law Firms, which are the biggest ones in the country, are using Exchange, 66% of them. So that's the Microsoft email server. Uh, the rest are using Novell and Lotus, and I think that that will continue to, to fall off as, as, as Microsoft becomes more and more strong on the email and uh, sharing end of the scheme. And I'll show you what I mean about sharing in a second. Because lawyers are not only using Outlook for email, they're using it for sharing documents, sharing calendars, and sharing other information. It's becoming groupware, where a group of people, a team of people, a practice group and a law firm can all get together in a public area on the email server and share a lot of their documents. Outlook is also the predominant contact manager. So where if you're a small lawyer, uh, you may use ACT or something sim simple like that. Uh, if you have an exchange server in a large law firm, you're probably using the contact section of that exchange server for law firm-wide contact management. Here's a screen, and it's hard to see, of course, uh, but this is an example of if you use Outlook, you may recognize the window here. And I've got a, a, a folder list right here. And this is public folders for my department at the ABA. It's on an Exchange server. I use Outlook as the way to get to it. And we have folders for information that people in my department share. Again, this is public. This is public to everybody in the department. I have my own private email, my own private calendar, and so on, also on Exchange. We have a shared calendar and shared contacts. And so if someone calls the, our department, if one of you were to call up and have a question, uh, and one of the staff in the department has already answered it, and it was a particularly good answer, uh, then that question and answer will appear in this knowledge base. So any person on our staff, and in fact anybody in the ABA in this particular case, can do a keyword search on all the files that are in this knowledge base. And if they get that question, then they can reuse the same answer that we've already done. They don't have to go back and do all the legwork that we did. And so that's, again, where group work comes in. You can start to share answers and information that you've found that other people will find useful. If you've ever been on a threaded discussion or a listserv, it's a similar kind of concept. But again, it's staying internal. It's using the email server that you already have in your law firm. And then when we talk about KnowledgeWare, all of this data is going to be available to your knowledge management system. This is a policy issue. You're going to have a policy that tells you how to use email, what you can send, what you can't send. Every message you send out is going to have those little confidentiality statements that I don't think are particularly useful. But they'll, they'll be attached automatically as that email is sent out there. There are no ethical restrictions on sending uh, unencrypted confidential uh, client information across the internet using email in any of the jurisdictions that I'm aware of. And so those are policy issues that your firm will decide. There are other policy issues because like a cell phone and like email, you're going to now be accessible 24 hours a day. And the question will be, does your firm want you to be 24 hours accessible and do you want to be? So when you're thinking about email, thinking about cell phone, think about practicing faster because you're going to have to be accessible a lot more than you have been in law school. Um, people will be able to get to you any time of the day. <clears throat> and you need to really think about how you're going to manage all of that information. Email filters will allow you to do some of that, where in your email program, a message comes in, and the software will look at it and say, this is from such and so a person, or it contains such and so keywords in it, or it's come at such a time of day, or whatever. It will then be moved into a special folder so that you can either look at it now because it's particularly urgent, or you can look at it later because it's not urgent at all. It allows you to manage your email so that your inbox doesn't become this big uh, bucket of nothing, where you have to go through every single email, whether it's important or not important, in order to figure out what's going on. Um, and yet use email carefully, because you have to be using client information when you're sending and receiving. Uh, you typically will not be able to encrypt, because the people on the other end will not be able to decrypt whatever you send. Uh, and so if you're sending confidential information, you need to know that your client is expecting it and doesn't mind you doing so. Case management. This is one of the two products that I consider cornerstones. That would be a faulty building because you need four corners for a building. But it's two products that are really uh, key to uh, a law firm technology, and case management is probably the biggest one. It takes all of the information that you capture about your cases, addresses, file notes, depositions, chronologies, uh, email, to-do items, everything that you do in relation to a case, and it puts it into a single system that is accessible via keywords. It's accessible to other lawyers in the firm so that if someone gets a phone call and speaks to the client and makes notes in it, they can save it into that electronic case file and when you come in the next day, you can see that a call was uh, caught by a particular attorney. This is what they said. This was a discussion. It's like a customer relationship system, except then you add into that all the briefs, all the motions, all the letters that you've ever generated for that person. You've got all the, the current contact information in a single place. It is a one-stop shop for all of the information about your, your client files. It allows you to synchronize out to your PDA. Of course, you can get it over your desktop or over your laptop. 
More importantly, though, to me, is that it saves you a whole lot of time. And I can't stress this enough. You can sort of see that that's a document. Pretend that all, all of those lines are text. Where the lines are lighter rather than darker, those would be database fields in a form letter or a form document that was on your document management system. You would go into your case management system. I would open Suzy Q's case file. And I'd say, I want to send this letter to Suzy Q on this particular topic. The form would be opened up in Microsoft Word. And it would automatically extract all of that data, address information, uh, case matter information, he and she information, whatever other information has been coded into that form. And I would have that form letter automatically. I wouldn't have to go through and do any typing. I wouldn't have to compare databases or other information. It allows you to generate those files. More importantly, once you've generated that file, you've, you've finished your editing, you can save it into the system. Another attorney can come and review it if that's the process, the process that happens at your firm. Or it gets saved back as part of the case management. So again, the next day, the other attorney comes into the office. They see that you sent out this letter. They don't duplicate your work. Things aren't missed because information isn't being shared. Here's an example of the elite case management system. This is a typical screen. See at the top, it's got the case matter, uh, client number, which office is handling it. Is the, is the case open or closed? So again, we're not just talking about all your current case information. You may be able to go back and look at uh, previous case files. That'll be important in conflict checking to make sure you're not representing someone uh, who is in conflict with someone you've represented in the past. Uh, and you'll see over here, related matter, uh, information, uh, billing information, financial information, uh, disposition of the case, client details. All sorts of information can be captured and locked into the single case management system. So again, it becomes a one-stop uh, place for all of your information, ma'am. In the large law firms, uh, is the day-to-day -day use of paper files um, you know, eliminated? I mean, uh, Not at all. <laughs> With all the technology that we're talking about, yeah, there's still an awful lot of paper. Uh, the better law firms are moving away from anything that can't be uh, uh, kept electronically. Uh, they're trying to put everything that they can into the system. They're scanning it in. Uh, depositions are, are being brought in on disks. So they're dumped into the system that way. Um, but there's going to be no getting away from a certain level of paper. But it's getting less and less and less. And the larger firms are doing much better about uh, uh, alleviating that. Sir. Is that a, a particular type of case management system? Are there different brand names of case management systems? There are. And if so, uh, do most firms have, is that part of first year training, summer associate training? And how, how do new lawyers get familiar with it? Uh, as far as I know, and this is anecdotal because we've never looked at, at training in law firms for anything other than legal research, uh, and that is uh, they pick it up as they go. There's not a whole lot of uh, introduction to it. Um, a lot of the first year law firm uh, time is spent doing research uh, and writing and not dealing with the business end of, of the practice. Elite is one of the leading uh, vendors. Um, there are a couple others that would, uh, would appear, but this is typical. Uh, even if your law firm doesn't have Elite, this would be typical of what you would see uh, in a firm area. And it, this is just one module. So Elite sells time and billing. They sell, and we'll see that in a second, they sell uh, uh, general ledger. They sell all the systems that you would need in a law firm. Some law firms build their own, which I think is uh, completely nuts. Um, uh, but there are some other products as well that are, that depending on how big your law firm is, I mean, if you're a big firm, then you may have uh, such and so a, a product. If you're really massive, you may write your own. I mean, I'm not sure what Baker and McKenzie uses. I think they use Elite. Um, but most of these products will scale up into the uh, tens and twenties of thousands of people. Time and billing, you're going to love this. Uh, attorneys are most of the time entering their own time. They're either writing it down on paper in the, in the smaller of the large firms, because every large firm has automated this. Um, or they're doing it directly into computer screens. And that's much more likely for what you're going to be doing. Keep in mind that if you don't do your time every month, your compensation may be withheld. So you may not be paid uh, at the end of the month if your time's outstanding. So it, we're not talking about whether you've met your 2,400 hours uh, for the year. We're talking about whether you've input your uh, day-to-day your -day, uh, time and billing information. Uh, because if they can't uh, generate the uh, bills for the customers, uh, then they can't pay you either. So they figure that if they withhold your paycheck as an incentive, then, uh, then they get where they want to be. Hourly billing is universal in the large law firms. Uh, we have looked at alternative bill billing strategies, and that's happening at the solo and small firm end, where I might say to a client, I'll do this case for 10,000, period. And then if I do it really fast and efficiently, then I, I get the benefit of, of essentially larger hourly uh, rates. If I do it slowly or it takes longer, or I've misjudged exactly how complex this case is, then I take a loss. But the client knows that they're going to get $10,000. Large law firms aren't doing that. You're going to be billing hourly across the way, and your clients will be expecting you to do so. Sir. Does that apply to litigation also? Because I heard contingent fees would be appropriate in the case code. Mostly at small firms. Yeah, can, uh, when you're talking about large firms, you're really talking hourly fees. Contingency fees won't happen at the largest firms. 
Uh, a time enveloping screen, again, it's a sample, it's from Elite, uh, but it gives you a sense of what kind of information you'll be asked to put in there. Uh, it'll automatically insert the date, you would put in the time, unless you do that automatically, and I'll show you in a second how you might do that. Ac the kind of activity you're doing, your law firm will have codes that say research equals A101, uh, calling client equals A102, and so on. So all of these things will be automatic. Uh, what location you're in, uh, client and matter, the information will be in here. If you have notes that you want to put in there, one of the nice things, though, and one of the things you should start practicing right from the get-go is that these programs have stopwatches. And so you don't have to remember, you know, what's that six minutes or is that 12 minutes or, you know, how long did I spend on that topic? You click on a button and a stopwatch starts and it keeps track of how much time you're using on that one. If you have a, an interrupting project come in, you stop the one stopwatch, you start a second one, that you follow that project while you're working on it, you stop that one, you go back. I mean, it's complex in a way, but it means that you don't have to think about all this data. It gets uh, input for you uh, when you go over to the time slip. When you close the stopwatch, it knows that you want to start a time record, and then that's locked into the system. You don't have to worry about end of the month having a stack of time that you don't really know what you did with. Knowledge management is more than a buzz is mostly a buzzword. It's not really a technology yet. It's something to think about though, because the largest law firms are all going towards it. They're not sure what they're going towards, but they're all going towards it. Um, it's a way to create a unified point to get access to all of the data in the systems. So case management will provide you an awful lot, and the document management system will provide you an awful lot of access and information. Uh, but you've still got email, and you've still got closed files, and you've still got things that were scanned in, and you've still got depositions that never made it onto the system. Knowledge management is trying to provide a way to get access to all of that information wherever it exists. The best systems are law firms where they say to a certain number of lawyers, hopefully most of them volunteer, um, you will help us to figure out what's going to go into this knowledge management system so that as part of the email retention, as part of the document reta retention plans, we can get rid of all the DREC that we don't need, but we're keeping all of the model forms, we're keeping all of the best practices, we're keeping all the workflow so that next time attorney X comes along and you've already gone through the process of going th from A to B and through trial and error, attorney X can go from A to B in the fastest possible way because they know exactly what you did as far as mistakes and they know how to get to the end, end point. In the same way that you might save your legal research, you know, the best searches you did, not the actual documents, but the best searches that, you, that were, were provided may be saved as part of the knowledge management. So that when Joe Lawyer leaves a firm, we still know exactly how he got from A to B on that particular case, and we've got all the documents that are relevant to that. It means that the next time we have that issue come up, it's much easier for the law firm to handle. We'll be able to do it much more efficiently and economically. That's a big question. <laughs> uh, doc, all of them will have document management systems, which does exactly what you say. But do, the document management system doesn't distinguish between good and bad and ugly. Uh, it is literally a listing of all of the documents that were prepared and inserted into the document management system. It is indexed, so you have keywords and you have you know, particular types of law that are, are reflected, you know who the author was and when it was created and client and, and matter and stuff like that. But no one has gone through and said, this is a really good example of X, or this is a really good example of Y, and this is something we should keep in a separate vault or a separate silo of information. Um, so all of them will have document management systems, but most of them will not have gone through any process of actually figuring out what's good and what's bad. Um, again, it ingr integrates in multiple databases. The products that are coming out now, like WestKM, that's probably one of the leading ones, and there are a couple of other products that are, are, are focused on knowledge management. They're typically search engines. Uh, Dolphin searches from Lexis. Um, they'll go through and they'll search all of your databases. You essentially have to tell them how to get to those databases, and then they'll keyword search and they'll index them. But you're really limited as far as whatever that tool will do. There's, again, there's no uh, way for that technology to go in and say, this is the best document on that uh, result. It's almost like having Google going through all your databases and saying, here are the things that we think are most relevant. And whether or not they are or not is going to depend on whether they've been keyed in properly so that a term of art that that particular firm uses or that particular lawyer uses has made it into the search terminology so that if someone says X, but they also mean Y and they didn't say so, Y will come back with all the results that say X. So it's still uh, early, early stages. Document management is the second cornerstone. Provides version control. Again, if you're creating a document on your laptop or, or desktop at your law firm, you want to save it into the document management system. It's easier for you to get to when you're away from your desk. It's easier for everybody else to get into. It's even easy for you to then go and look at other motions and briefs and things that were developed by other lawyers, so you don't have to start from scratch. When I worked at a, a law firm in Little Rock, uh, and I was said, they, they would say, you know, do a motion in limine. Well, <laughs> I've done lots of those in law school, you know. Uh, I would go into the document management system and do a search on limine, and I would see all the motions in limine that had been written by all the lawyers in our firm, 
and I could see which ones were applicable to what I was doing and which ones looked like they'd been written in a halfway cogent manner. I would then open those up, save it as my own copy, and then edit from there rather than trying to start from scratch, building the case citation and, and building all the, the language that was required for my jurisdiction. Um, it allows you to check the documents in and out. It's a good source for new documents if you're creating new ones. It may also be required by your court rules. So if you're practicing in Michigan, for example, the Michigan uh, Rules of Professional Conduct require you to have a retention policy. Uh, document management allows you to have a, an archive of all the documents that were created for a particular client. If that client leaves you, you can then zip up all those files, dump them on a CD, and give, the, give them to the person, and you've done your duty as far as your professional ethics. If you don't have all your documents in one location, then you're going to have to search all the hard drives of the people who have, who have been involved, or you're going to look for all the paper and those files that you haven't quite gotten rid of uh, and see if you can find all the files that haven't been printed. Scheduling and docketing. This may sound pretty innocuous. I mean, you're used to setting your own calendar dates and you know, marking them down. Think electronic for everything. Even if you have a day planner, you will probably want to be printing day planner pages from your uh, Outlook calendar uh, or from whatever uh, uh, electronic calendar system you're using. When we talk about docketing and scheduling, we're talking about critical dates, uh, deposition dates, court dates, things you don't want to miss unless you really want to pay a lot of money and lose your job. Um, critical dates like this are typically centralized. They don't allow the attorneys to have their hands on in this system. They're centralized so that there will be a docket management team. They will collect all of the data and they will make sure that it's kept up to date in the calendar. It will be reflected on your calendar so that you know what's going on. But when there are critical dates that need to be reflected, it will go through a centralized process. This is typically not something where everybody has their hands on the pie. One of the nice things is that most courts have electronic access to their dockets so that your docket team will be able to download the docket information from the courts that you're participating in and upload it into the system so you get the absolute uh, clearest information, which is the information that the judge is looking at. When we're talking about conflicts, you don't want to open a case for a new client, which is in direct opposition with a client you're op already uh, representing or have represented. Conflict checking will be a, a typical uh, routine matter. You will not probably be involved in it because it will happen when the case is opened. It will hire, happen in an administrative way. But again, when you put in your contacts into your contact system, either through Exchange, Microsoft Exchange, or through other, some other system like case management, someone will be going through there and checking against that to see, have we represented this person before? Have we been in opposition to this person before? And can we take the case that has just come in? You may rely on a case management system. There are dedicated conflicts checking software. Um, again, that gets away from the, the uh, perspective of having all the information in one database. So now you've got a case management system with X number of clients and a conflict checking system with X number of contacts, and those may not be the same systems or may, may not have the same information. Take a little bit of a discussion about uh, trial and court technology. Hopefully you will all get an opportunity to, 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 to deal with this. Um, it's pretty exciting what's been happening. It, in fact, it's far more exciting than office technology because, you know, office technology, it sits there, it doesn't do a whole lot. This is the, uh, the whiz-bang stuff. Even if you're not doing litigation, it's good to know about the stuff that's going to happen with litigation support. I'm going to tell you all about this cool stuff and then we'll talk about something that's a little bit more depressing, but there's an awful lot of good stuff to do when you're doing litigation. Trial preparation, you know, no-brainer. I can type an outline in, in, in Word and, I, you know, I've got all the information I want to. Not so. If you're doing a lot of litigation, there are specif specific products that will help you. Case map, time map, note map are the three uh, best. In fact, they were just bought out by a big publisher um, that allow you to do chronologies. And so once you've inputted all the information, you can then reorganize it by different categories and, and different ways so that you really get a sense of, of how your chronology works for your timeline for your case. And it, al it allows you to do more with the information than just having an outline format. Trial presentation. You may be a whiz at PowerPoint, and for most people, it will be just fine for doing presentations in courtrooms. If you want to do good trial presentation where we're talking about 3D imaging and things like that, there are products that will allow you to do that specifically. So when you have all of your exhibits in a, in a binder and you want to get to exhibit X, you're not clicking like I am going, uh, that's the one, you know, that's one. You have a little barcode scanner. You've got your binder here. You just flip to the page. You scan it with your barcode scanner and boom, up appears your, your image. So there are refined tools for people who are doing a lot of litigation. If you're not doing litigation, you still may want to think about them. But if you are doing litigation, you need to be considering these as mandatory tools for your practice. My favorite, though, and it's the least exciting sounding, is real-time transcription. You have to have done a deposition summary to understand why, re why real-time transcription is exciting. What it means is that I go into a, a deposition, and the court reporter is sitting next to me, and the court reporter is taking down all of the information the deponent is saying. They're, they're putting it into their, their computer system, and I'm connected up to it. And now I've got on my laptop a stream of all of the deponent's testimony coming right across. I can annotate it. I can highlight it. I can make little notes about what that person said. I can say, hang on a second. 
print it off on my portable printer, and I can go back and say, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, I want to go back and, and readdress this question. Because sometimes when you're taking that deposition, you get off track and you start asking questions over here where you meant to be going down here. Having the transcription in front of you means that you won't make that mistake, that you'll be able to come back as the, de the deposition is going on and ask the questions that you intended. This is stuff that you don't have to have any technology for. You bring your laptop and you hook up to the court reporter. The court reporter has to have the laptop. Um, but you can then have it downloaded. They give you a viewer so you can do all the work you need to on your own laptop. And as you leave that deposition, you now have, ha now have the entire transcription on your, your machine. You don't have to wait the two or three days for the diskette. You don't have to wait for someone to transcribe it into those beautiful, fat uh, uh, binders that they come in uh, when you get the paper deposition. You've got it all right there. You can keyword search it. You can dump it into your litigation support software. It's, it's a, just a great tool. OK, here's the depressing part. Largest law firms are outsourcing all of this, this fun stuff. So uh, if you're doing index and scanning, transcription preparation of exhibits, uh, leasing hardware for barcode scanning, most of this stuff, there are litigation support companies who will do all of this for you. You may have paralegals who do some level of it. Typically, the attorney is not going to be involved in it. But it's good to know that this stuff is there, because you may get into a, a position where you've got a case that's going to go to trial. You've got to do some litigation support. And you don't know where to get started as far as some of these resources. A litigation support vendor can help you to do that. It can also help just to describe some of the things that you might want to do or might uh, want to prepare in order, for your, in order to be prepared well for your trial. Courtroom hardware. How many people have been to the, uh, the courtroom in Raleigh? Anybody? Federal courtroom? You should all go. Um, it's the best place to practice with the technology. And they don't care. They like you to come in and, and, and just tool around. There's going to be a person at that court. I have no idea who it is who will be responsible for that technology. And they will give you a tour of all of the systems that they have there. The federal courts are leading the way in technology for courtrooms. And if you want to, you can go down there with a laptop and a PowerPoint and actually see what it would be like to put an exhibit up or to display something and have the jury see it inside a courtroom. But I would highly recommend that if anybody's got time for a field trip, that they go to the nearest federal court uh, to wherever they are and, uh, and go and look at it. High-tech systems uh, for electronic filing. They're aggressive in electronic case management, so a lot of the federal courts will, will be managing their cases electronically. Uh, and then they've got the highest tech hardware. So you're going to have video conferencing abilities in federal courtrooms. You'll have uh, document cameras like you do in this classroom. I mean, you may take for granted all the, the whiz-bang stuff that's here. Um, most of the state courts in North Carolina and the rest of this country are not going to have anything close to what you have available in this, in this uh, classroom. That is actually a, 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 a point I'd forgotten to make. If you can't get to a federal court, get Kenner or Wayne or s someone on their staff to show you how to use everything here, because it will give you a similar experience. You'll put up something that you'd intended to use for your opening statement in your moot court trial, and you'll put it up in PowerPoint, and you'll say, gosh, that looks terrible. And you'll start to realize that technology is great, but it's not always the best way to deliver the information you want to. But until you see how it looks or how it feels, you don't want to do that the first day that you're walking into your uh, high-tech court uh, uh, and doing a trial for the large law firm. You want to do some practice while you've got resources available. When you're in practice, go to the courtroom. When you're at, at the law school, do it here. Court file access, for the most part, beyond docket information, you're not going to get access to anything. Uh, they are not uh, scanning in all the documents that are sent to them. Unless it's been filed electronically, it's not going to be in an electronic format. Uh, the information you're going to be able to get from a court is going to be docket information. Uh, and your document folks are going to get that. They don't want you handling that. Um, it's going to change more as there are more cases filed. But still, electronic filing is happening mostly at the federal level not at the uh, state level. So word about uh, electronic court filing. Federal bankruptcy courts, you're guaranteed to be able to file in a federal bankruptcy court and nowhere else. Everything else is maybe. Maybe here, maybe there. The federal courts are moving very quickly to electronic court filing in all of their courts, but it's not there yet. The bankruptcy courts are there first. There's no other broad implementation of e-filing. So if you want to do e-filing, you need to really check with the court and the jurisdiction that you're going to be filing in and see if they do it. Courtlink, for example, courtlink.com is one of the leading vendors. They've been bought by Lexis, and they will do court filing. They've created the relationship with the court. So you can go to Courtlink, buy a subscription, and then if you want to do, do court filing, you can do so, so long as Courtlink has created the relationship with that particular court. That doesn't mean that electronic court filing is not going to be available if it's not available at a federal court or, at, uh, or if you're not in a federal court or if you're not using a Courtlink court. Washtenaw County in Michigan is my favorite example because they do electronic court filing, which means that you can send an email attachment unencrypted, or you can send a, uh, a floppy disk. You can walk it down to the courthouse. And they consider that to be electronic court filing. So electronic court filing, as a definition, really ranges from I'm sitting at my desk, and I never leave it, and I still get to file the document, too. I put it on a floppy, and I walk down to the courthouse, and they think that that's just the snazziest thing that they've got. So it's going to range all across the board. Check, though, before you count on uh, doing e-filing. 
check your jurisdiction. And once you check the jurisdiction, remember that every judge is an island. And the, a courtroom may or a court may say, yes, we'll all do it. And Judge X says, I'm not taking an electronic court file document. So you need to make sure both at the jurisdiction level and at the, at the court that the particular judge you're dealing with is, is comfortable with that. Just a word about video conferencing because it gets a lot of hype. People think it's a great technology. It's not being adopted by law firms. It probably will not be adopted by law firms in, in it to any great extent. Only about half of the large law firms are using it at all. Uh, most of the attorneys in, in the country are not using it at all. And we've actually seen a decrease in the last two years uh, in use of video conferencing. It's still too expensive. And there's still the whole issue of if I'm doing a video conferencing with someone, am I really supporting the client relationship in the way I want to? Um, one thing that I think technology hurts lawyers with is that it makes, gives you a sense of, I can do anything because I've got the technology to do it. Uh, but you've really got to support that client relationship. And video conferencing can damage that. Where we are seeing it being used primarily is with lawyers in the same firm in different offices geographically so they don't have to fly. Uh, and we're seeing it uh, with clients who happen to have the technology. But again, it's at the very largest law firms where they've invested you know, $20,000 or $30,000 per room to have uh, video conferencing available in their system. And then they're willing to support the bandwidth in order to connect up their offices. There are some possible opportunities, though. Even if your law firm doesn't have video conferencing, most of the federal courts will. So if there is a court hearing that you want to participate in or if there's something that you want to do, that relates to a court, you may still be able to do it. Kinko's often will have a video conferencing hookup that will work just fine with the federal court's technology. Or your law, fir law firm technology may work with the federal courts. So there may be some opportunities to do that. It's just almost no one is doing it right now. OK, I'm going to spin through these last couple of web slides. Um, intranets are websites that are pr protected by passwords or security so that no one on the outside of your law firm will be able to get access to it. Uh, they have a lot of promise. They can become a, a portal, an access point for your email, your calendar, your case management system, your document management system. They can become a, a window for everything in your, in your law firm. Uh, and of course, we're, we've missed the boat. Most internet pages in law firms are uh, a link page, a page of really useful links of stuff that's outside the law firm. And why would you password protect that? So uh, I think what we'll see in the, in the near future is people will be buying IBM WebSphere. Uh, they'll be buying uh, Microsoft SharePoint, which is a really slick little portal uh, deal, which comes with digital dashboards. Or they'll be buying Plumtree, uh, Lexus's uh, marketing Plumtree, uh, customized for lawyers with hooks from uh, the Plumtree portal over to Lexus. Um, that's where the future will be. So instead of having to go to the case management software here and the conflict checker here, it's not quite knowledge management. But it allows you, as the user, to open up a web page and see all the information that you've got going on for that day, your critical dates, your email, uh, and news about the firm, recent newsletters, everything that you want to have uh, customized there. Extranets are like intranets in that they're protected web pages, but they're protected so that someone outside the law firm can get in to a certain segment of information that you want to make available to them. The largest clients are asking their large law firms to make these things available so that they can come in and check their, their billing data on a regular basis. You may also make documents and other things available. Again, this isn't something that you would necessarily say, I'm going to have an extranet for all my clients. Uh, a client will come and have a particular need, and the IT staff will develop an extranet for that person. Typically, when that happens, the client uh, product or the cl client project will go on for a certain period of time, and then the extranet will be closed down and rolled up. So what we're, we saw that uh, in 2001, 89% had had at least one uh, uh, extranet that was slightly uh, down, or, I mean, uh, 2002 is slightly down from the 2001 numbers. Uh, and most of them don't have any more than one. So they're saying, you know, Client X has come to us and said, we want an extranet. We'll provide information uh, to that person through that extranet. Um, and that's all they're doing with it. A little bit of internet collaboration. Uh, probably most of you have been in chat rooms or know what they are. There are online deal rooms that are similar. There's online conferencing uh, where you can actually share an online environment. Neither of those are getting a whole lot of traction with lawyers. Most lawyers are sending emails, and they're sending email attachments if they have to do document sharing. They find that to be faster and easier. Everybody's got email, and everybody's got uh, uh, the ability to open up the attachments that are sent. There are some communities you will want to check with your large law firm before you uh, subscribe to them. Trialnet.com, for one, is a place where they share information about experts. They share information about briefs and other uh, work that's going on. All the lawyers have created a community so that they share information in a secure and private area where people pay in order to participate, and they pay a lot. Um, but it's a, a very valuable collaboration environment. And then online deal rooms. I'm going to say just one more word about that, because online deal rooms you probably wouldn't use on your own. I'm not even sure if they're a great opportunity for lawyers, but large clients like them because they force uh, their, uh, their um, customers and people into an environment where they've got a deal, they've got to settle a dispute through an online uh, resource. And so you may get dragged into using that kind of technology merely because your clients uh, want you to. 
legal research. We all know that everything is now for free on the web, so we don't need Westlaw or Lexis anymore. Um, lawyers haven't figured that out. Uh, that's sarcastic, by the way. Um, even when it's on the web for free, don't trust it. Um, even if it's the court that has issued the opinion, unless it's the same day that that court issued the opinion, be aware that sometimes opinions change and the, the page on the website is not necessarily updated, even though the West Reporter or the Westlaw uh, uh, database is. So although you can use the free internet, and there's an awful lot of good information out there, uh, you need to be aware that the information that you use, if you're going to rely on it for case citation, citations or, or other information, that you've really gone through a, a legitimate, valid uh, site that you know for sure has the latest, greatest. And that's why we're still seeing an awful lot of reliance on fee-based systems. Historically, your firm might have both Westlaw and Lexis, which is why we see them both in the law schools. Um, not anymore. The law firms are trying to choose one or the other, and they're playing one against the other. So uh, many of the large law firms are going to a single contract with one vendor rather than contracts with both, uh, both vendors. But they are supplementing their fee-based searches. So what you may get is a, stay there, what you may get is a uh, research assignment that says go and do X, and they will expect you to start the search for free on Google, which has an awful lot of uh, interesting information on it, um, if you do the search correctly. And once you've found, sort of narrowed down the scope of what you're looking for, then you're going to translate that over into West or Lexis or whichever proprietary database you're using. So they're not using them as an exclusive resource method, but they are using them as a way to jumpstart and keep down the costs of research. So some final thoughts. It's a competitive edge in all the major law firms. Uh, if you go to a large law firm, it's going to touch absolutely everything you do. It doesn't mean you have to uh, subordinate your intellectual process to the technology. You need to still remember that this is all just enabling you to do more. Um, it, you should take advantage of these tools because there are very few places in the legal profession that you're going to get access to this kind of technology. In three years, which seems to be about the time that the churn rate starts and a lot of lawyers ditch the large law firms because they're burned out and they go to smaller practices or medium practices, you may not have the same technology access, but if you've picked up the skills that those tools will allow you to do to be more efficient and a better lawyer, you can take those skills with you and then look for the technology that will fit your, your needs. We've talked a lot about top-down uh, decision-making in the technology in large law firms. Just because they don't have it doesn't mean that they, they don't know that they need it uh, or don't know that they want it. Uh, if you have an idea or if you see a better way of doing something with technology, the best eyes are the newest ones. And so if you've just joined a firm, make sure you, you bring it up with the IT staff or the technology committee and let them know that you're aware that there are other ways to do this and, and, and here's something else that the law firm might want to do. Be aware that it may be something that they know about and it's just not a priority. Um, and I wouldn't talk about products. I would talk about things, you know, processes that you think can be done better. Um, and they're going to be open to it because they want to make more money uh, and they want to use the technology uh, to the best extent that they can. And then finally, don't allow technology to interfere with your relationship with your client. Uh, it really is a tool, uh, and you can get sucked into the uh, belief that technology will do everything, it will manage everything, and your client will hate you uh, because you don't re return their emails fast enough, you don't return their phone calls. You allow uh, auto replies from your email program to, uh, to say, yeah, I got your message, and I'll get right back to you next week. Um, or you, they get a voicemail. You've got to make sure that the technology enables you to do more better, uh, but it doesn't overwhelm your relationship with your client. So thanks very much. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but I really appreciate you taking the time, and I hope you enjoy the pizza and Coke. Sir. Yeah, I had a question about uh, the PDAs and the uh, start, stop type of uh, timekeeping program. Sure. Uh, have they ported that kind of stuff to the PDAs? Mostly, yes. Uh, almost only to Palm devices, though. Uh, pocket PCs have just not caught on. So if you have a compact iPad, it's going to be tougher. Um, but if you've got a Palm-based device, like a Palm Pilot or a handspring visor or I think even Handera does a, the Palm OS. As long as it's Palm OS, most of the systems are synchronizing that way. Um, the other way you can do it, well, the time management doesn't work that way. Now, the time management would only work with the Palm devices. I was going to say, you can do some things through Outlook. And so Outlook will, of course, work great with Windows or Microsoft's Pocket PC stuff. But, uh, uh, and, and the Palm devices too, uh, will, too, but you don't get any of the time management through that, that window. Anything else? Sir. Except that the regular stuff is the, the ratio to the lawyers is just decreasing as the firm gets bigger? Right, slightly. Rather than one to one. And in fact, from firms from 50 to 100, we're seeing that it's like 1.2 to 1. So 1 1.2 uh, non-technical staff to lawyers. But once they get over 100, it seems to drop just below one. So there will be maybe 10 lawyers for every uh, nine uh, uh, non-technical staff. But I think that's just size. I mean, when you're talking about 3,500 lawyers, there's probably enough duplication of tasks in the non-technical side 
uh, in the staff side, administrative side, that you can afford to lose a certain amount of headcount there. And of course, you're expected to do more with the technology. Anybody else? All right, thanks very much.